Father, we invite you to this place this morning, Jesus. Lord, would your spirit move in us, Father? Would your spirit move in us, Jesus? Lord, as we begin to worship you and praise you, Father, you reign, Lord, above everything, Jesus, above everything in our hearts and our lives, Father. It is you that we exalt, you that we lift up, Father. We come here this morning, Lord, united, Lord, to praise your holy name, Father.
much Jesus that we can fill our minds with and our days with Lord help us to remember Jesus how much you have done for us Lord help us to remember God the things that you have done in the past how faithful you have been in the past Lord and how in any circumstance Lord we can always give you thanks we can always give you praise we can always think of one at least one thing to be grateful for Lord Lord, help us to press in, to remember your goodness, God. How loving you are, Jesus. How you redeemed us, how you healed us, Jesus. How much you love us, God, and how much you continue to pour out your love over us, Lord. Help us to remember, God, and to never forget, Lord. You are so good, Jesus. Till I lay my head, oh, I will sing. 
1 Peter chapter, th- chapter 1 verse 3 says, All praise to God. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Father, we give you all the praise this morning. God, we don't want anything to steal the praise that you alone are worthy of. We thank you for your great mercy. Because of your great mercy, we stand here. Because of your great mercy, we're able to worship you. We're able to lift our hands. We're able to sing to you. We're able to pray to you. It is because of your great mercy and all praise, God, belongs to you. We thank you for our salvation because you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you so much, Lord, that we belong to you. We thank you so much that we can be here this morning in your presence. We thank you for every person here, every person watching online, every family, every elder, every child, every teen. We thank you, God, so much. This morning, your people, we give you praise. We give you praise for the salvation that we have received for the joy that we have received, for the freedom that we have received. We thank you, God. Everything is because of you. Everything we have is thanks to you. We thank you, God, so much. Come on, lift your hands this morning and give him the praise that he is worthy of. We give you praise, God. We give you praise. Come on, this morning, don't let anything take God's praise. It's not because of your strength. It's not because of your wisdom. It's not because of what you possess. It's not because of what you've earned on your own. It's because of His great mercy. Come on, give Him praise. We give you praise, Lord. Praise is to your Hallelujah. to your mighty name we sing praises to your mighty name Lord we sing praises to your mighty name all praise all praise Lord belongs to you we give you God the praise of our lips of our heart we give you the praise Lord this morning we thank you so much we thank you so much for your great mercy We thank you so much for this morning, this day that you have made. We thank you for everything, God. We thank you. Come on together, let's give him a mighty shout of praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. A mighty shout. A mighty shout. A mighty, mighty shout. I want you to tell your neighbor, because of God's mercy, you're here. Give him a high five, a handshake, a hug, at least a smile. Welcome to Church of Truth. We're so happy that you were able to make it here this morning. It is good to be in the house of God. Somebody please help me. It is good to be in the house of God. Good to see you. We have um, just a few announcements for you. Um, Teens internship deadline is this Wednesday 
We have a good group of teens already signed up. We have the best teens at Church of Truth. Um, if you're visiting from another church, God bless you, but we got the best teens in Church of Truth. And next week, right, next week, we are starting teens internship. It's going to be a two-week day camp. They're going to be coming here, getting dropped off in the morning. We're going to be going through the Word of God and... Uh, teaching them and worshiping together and praying together. They're going to have practical stuff they're going to be doing. Uh, we believe as a church it is in our heart to invest into the next generation. And we, if you have been to Tuesday night prayers or to teen services when teens are leading worship, are preaching, are sharing, God is raising up some mighty, mighty teenagers that, are, that love God, that are going to serve God. They're going to do great things, greater things than we have done. But we need to invest into them to see that. And so this teens internship is going to be a big part of us investing into our teens during the summer, summer time. This is the first time we're doing it. So if you haven't signed up your teenager, I really, really want to encourage you to do that and not miss this opportunity. I believe they're going to be so blessed. If you have a financial difficulty or for whatever reason it's just too much to pay for the teen, to pay for teens camp, you're sending kids to kids camp, and... Uh, and it's a lot. It's a lot of money. If that is an issue for you at all, please reach out to us. Reach out to our office. Re reach out to any of us if you can come up to the front. Whatever, however you want to reach out. But reach out. Don't let be finances be the reason that you don't send your teen or your kid to teens internship or to teens camp or to kids camp. Amen? Amen. Um, and with that, can I get a drum roll, please? That is, we need... Worship team, please help me out, man. Teach people how to do... Drum roll, please. Kids camp registration is officially open. Or it's been open. Whatever. It's open now. That's, I don't know why they do the... T kids camp registration open now. It's like big letters. Like it's a... It's a whatever. I'm just, I'll, I'll talk to the team about this, but they're making it seem here very clearly that it just opened. So can I get a... Loud shout of praise. It's open now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Parents are excited, but we are so excited about our kids' camp. And you can sign your kids up for this kids' camp. And if you want to be involved in kids' ministry, besides this kids' camp, I think they already have enough volunteers. But kids' ministry and overall is in need of volunteers to get connected and plugged in. Um, so if that's something that you want to do, it, it is an amazing opportunity. Um, but this kids camp is going to be the best one yet. Every year it gets better and better. So this, we're so excited about this year's kids camp. And so is everybody else, right? Okay, really quick, I want to share. And we're going to gather, um, collect an offering like we do every Sunday. If you've brought your offering or you'll be giving through push pay. But I want to read before we give out of Romans chapter 12. This is the second, uh, second verse, but it's the second part of the verse where it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And I want to focus just really quickly on the second part of this verse that says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Powerful words. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the way, at least this is what I've seen in my life, because of the way that we think, we form things that we are convinced of. How we view things, how we see things how we think about a certain thing. Maybe the way we think about giving. Maybe the way we think about work, we think about church. You know, some of us that have grown up in church, sometimes we need the most changing of mind to view church the right way. Because of the way that we think, we become convinced of certain things. And sometimes it's very hard to unconvince ourselves or to have, have somebody else help us be unconvinced. But the word of God says that the word of God itself is like a mirror. It shows you. 
who you really are. It challenges, are you ready, your thinking. And this verse says that we have to let God transform us into a new person by changing the way that we think. How do we think about ourselves? How do we think about giving? How do we think about our jobs, our families, our church, ministry? How do we think about everything? How do we think? If you let God change the way you think, the Bible gives you a promise that you'll become a new person. And sometimes only the word of God, sometimes only the word of God can show us things that we have become convinced of to then help us change us the way, help us change the way we think about these things that will in result change me. If you're a business owner, sometimes we need to change the way that we think. If you're a stay-at-home mom, sometimes we need to change the way that we think. If you're, on ministry, if you're in ministry, if you're on staff, or if you don't get involved in church, we need to allow God to change the way we think, and he can do that for us through his word. Something, something you don't see, something that you've become convinced of from your childhood, but the word of God can change. Allow the word of God to be a mirror in your life. It will change the way that you think, and it will change you. Amen? Can we stand together and pray? for our offering, for ourselves. More importantly, the way that we think we're going to pray about. Father, we thank you so much for this morning and being able to give, being able to be here. We thank you for your word in our life. Your word challenges, God, our thinking. It challenges our convictions. It challenges our outlook. It cha challenges our perspective. And we want to let you, Lord, we want to let you change us by changing the way that we think. We want your word to to be like that double-edged sword that cuts between bone and marrow into the depths of our heart, into the depths of our mind to show us, God, to show us the things that need to change, to, sh to allow your word to change our conviction convictions, to change our perspective, to change what we have become convinced of. We thank you so much for the blessing it is to be a part of your church, to, for the blessing it is to be able to give, to be a part of your kingdom, what you are building here on this earth. We thank you that this money doesn't just belong to the church or we're giving to man, we're giving to you. We're giving into your kingdom. We're giving in to what you are building on this earth. And we thank you, God, that everything we have, it truly does belong to you. And we bless, we bless each other. We bless our mind. We bless ourselves to think the way your word says, to think the way the word of God thinks. And we thank you so much. We want to be transformed into that new person. We want to be changed into the image of Christ more and more. And we thank you, God, so much that this is possible through the word of God. And so we thank you. We thank you for your word speaking to us, your word changing us in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you so much, Lord, as Alex is going to take stage to preach this morning. We bless. We bless him. We bless each other. We thank you for our hearts to be open to your word this morning, to receive from you, God. We thank you so much. If there's somebody new here, God, we pray that you would speak to them, bring your conviction into their life. We thank you that people today would leave full of your word, full of faith, touched by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. And the church said... Amen. Give me, a, give please a loud and warm welcome to Alex as he takes stage. Well, good morning, family. My name's Alex. I'm going to be sharing a pretty simple message this morning, um, and we're going to be in the book of Joshua. How's everyone doing? Awesome, awesome. Looks like there's still quite a bit of you here despite the nice weather, so that's awesome. Um, so can I just notice something before we get into the word? Um, we live in a world of efficiency. Everything we do is about like getting it done and getting it done well, getting it done fast. We're done with one thing, we move on to the next, and to the next, and to the next, and honestly, we don't usually look back very much. If, if I were to ask, if I were to pass out flashcards, let's say, and I were to ask everyone in this room to give me a list of, of things that you think are the greatest enemy to our faith, I'm guessing at the top of that list, you wouldn't have the word forgetfulness or something like that. I mean, we pay our bills, we go to school, go to work, we come home, do our chores, go to bed, wake up, do the same thing over again, but how often do we actually pause to remember God and what he's done for us intentionally? And what really does that do to our faith? 
Um, today, like I said, we're going to be in Joshua. I'm going to be in chapters 3 and 4. Uh, we're going to do some reading, so please stay with me. Uh, we're going to skip around a little bit, uh, and I'll try to make sure to um, tell you where we are so we can keep up. Um, okay, but before we get into Joshua, let's familiarize ourselves a little bit with what's going on. Uh, so, jo- the book of Joshua pretty much begins with the death of Moses. Now, Moses is the guy through whom God took the Israelites out of bondage and, and slavery in Egypt and led them through the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, he split the Red Sea for them through Moses when they were being chased by their previous captors when they changed their mind about letting them go. And then the sea closed, and that's how they got rid of the people who had them as slaves. And this was all done through Moses. Moses was their guy. Moses was the guy who heard from God. He was the guy who gave them their commandments. He was the guy who set everything up. Their whole lifestyle was wrapped up in what, Moses, what God had done through Moses for them. And then Moses dies. And the people mourn. They're not sure what to do, what happens now. A guy named Joshua is appointed as the new leader. And in uh, Joshua chapter 3, we basically come to a point where God is saying, Joshua, I'm going to show them that I'm with you just as I was with Moses. And so that's where we pick up. Now, they're at the Jordan River. Remember, God parted the Red Sea before and they crossed. Now they're at the Jordan River. And Moses knew that they were going to be there. But they have to cross the Jordan in order to get into the promised land that God told them was going to be theirs. And as they approach this Jordan River, Joshua basically says, okay, guys, God spoke to Joshua, and he said, okay, guys, get ready. Tomorrow, God's going to do something very awesome. And spoiler alert, they cross the river. But I want us to pay attention to what God has them do as soon as they cross it and why he has them do what he has them do. Okay, so I want us to pay very close attention to the detail here. All right, so a bit of reading. We'll start at Joshua chapter 3, verse 14. Joshua chapter 3, verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now, I'm just going to pause for a second. The Ark of the Covenant is something that represents the very presence and power of God. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the river stops flowing. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. So we're going to go into chapter 4 now. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you, and put them down in the place where you stay tonight. Now let's just recap what happened. The people crossed the Jordan on dry ground, right? The river is stopped, people cross, and what the Lord has the people do is take, there's twelve tribes there, and he has... He has them choose one person from every tribe to go back to the middle of the Jordan where the presence of God still is and grab a stone to remember what just happened and carry it over to where they're staying tonight. Uh, Verse 4, so Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp when they put them down. Where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. Uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 12. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh crossed over, ready for battle, in front of the Israelites, as Moses had directed them. About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. Uh, keep that in mind. We're going to jump down to verse 20. And Joshua. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, 
Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan until, before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea, remember earlier? when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. We did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know, or he did this, sorry, so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Okay, everyone still here? Um, awesome. So before we jump back into what just happened, um, we often forget what God, who God is and what God has done in our busy lives. Uh, it's, not, it's not that we don't want to remember, it's usually a tendency, naturally, we forget. Um, and forgetting, since forgetting happens naturally, then remembering is something that actually takes effort. Um, a lot of people, when they leave Christianity, they leave because they slip into some sort of complacency until there's no God left in their conscience, even though he's never changed. Forgetting who God is and what he's done is something people drift into. I love the quote from uh, Quaker theologian Richard Foster when he wrote, in contemporary society, our adversary, meaning the devil, majors in three things. He majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. If the enemy can't cause you to deny God, to believe lies about him, or to reject him, all he needs to do is cause you to forget him and what he has done. Some may have raised their hand, said a prayer, and a few years down the road, continue to live lives as functional atheists. Not because they don't believe God exists anymore, but simply because they live as if he's not there. And it's as if he never did the things that we asked him for a year ago, even maybe a month ago, and praised him for back then. Forgetfulness is something that happens naturally, which is why God warns us over and over and over and over and over and over, all throughout the Old and New Testaments, to remember the Lord your God. There's also a theme of warnings as to what happens when we forget. Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egypt earlier, reminded them of what God had done uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. He said this, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. See, for the Jewish people, um, back then and today, remembrance is built into the entire system. You have your rituals, you have your festivals, you have your feasts. All of these things are made to keep the, the, the involvement and actions of God, what he's done, ingrained into our society. They, we do things that remind us of who God is. But in the New Testament, we have Jesus' communion words echo, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Having a practice of remembering who God is and what he's done is one of the most important spiritual practices we could have. And oftentimes it's overlooked today, myself included. We have iCloud, we have Google Calendar, we have contacts list. I, I don't know anyone who remembers phone numbers anymore. And if we want something, we'll just look it up. But the thing is, remembering God and what he's done, this practice isn't something that we can just download from the cloud. It's something that we get to participate in and practice, practice, practice. We fully immersed, really slow down and, and give God our attention. Regularly remembering who he is and what he's done is a necessity for anyone, whether you're an ancient Jew about to cross the Jordan River or you live in Vancouver in 2022. We have a forgetfulness problem and it's affecting our spiritual health. So then, what's the solution? Well, we need to cultivate. We need to cultivate a discipline of remembrance in our lives. Uh, in order to battle the busy, hurried spiral of forgetfulness. We need to keep God on our minds. There's a way to build remembrance into our lives. My, my message this morning is basically to remind us to not forget to grab the stones from the middle of your Jordan River and put them where you will remember what God has done. So if you're taking notes, there's gonna be three things I'm gonna talk about. Remembering, what, remembering God and what he's done allows for three fundamental things to happen in our lives and affect our spiritual growth and our faith. The first one uh, is it brings an awareness of God's presence and involvement in our lives. Think about that communion example from Jesus. Do this in remembrance of him. What a beautiful picture for the people of God to get together and do something that Jesus commanded us to do in remembrance of him. 
Now, there's so much more than just remembrance going on there, but it's at least that as well. <clears throat> practicing remembrance is, is important. There's a real presence of Jesus when we're practicing communion. And just like the communion has a more felt presence of Jesus, so does practicing remembering God in our daily lives bring him closer than ever before. See, what does an awareness of God's involvement uh, in our lives actually look like? In a world of clicks, likes, and follows, uh, we're, we have a world of distraction around us, and we're called to dig deep and, and be present as we remember who he is and what he's done for us. This requires deep reflection to really slow down. Look at the moments you were anxious or fearful and he's brought you through. Look at the moments where he was faithful and really meditate on that for a moment. Think about it. The people of Israel, right, they experienced incredible supernatural signs and wonders. I mean, these people saw the Red Sea part in front of them. They saw God's, God's judgment on the Pharaoh for, for keeping them in slavery. They, they saw all these things. They saw a pillar of cloud by day literally leading them through the wilderness, fire by night. They had manna and quail fall from the sky, basically. They, they saw all of these things, and, and still God was instructing them to remember, remember, remember. And we see over and over again how they fall into this cycle of forgetting who God is and in turn brought idolatry when they started looking for something else other than the God who brought them out. How important do you think it is in our lives today, in 2022, to, to practice something that reminds us of God so quickly do we forget? The current stats on, de uh, on forgetfulness are honestly kind of depressing, so we're not even going to go there. But when we do remember, <laughs> trying to keep it positive, but when we do remember our identity is shaped by it, actually, because we start to remember what God has done for us, and we begin to be shaped by our past, and it transforms our future. We must treat this. This isn't just something that we do, you know, in passing or something that we're just like, yeah, we need to remember God, yay. Like, no, we have to treat this with a sense of holiness and reverence. Um, what God did in your life, God is holy, and what he did in your life is nothing short of the direct involvement of a holy God. And you're not here by accident. You're not here by accident. He placed you in this time and this season for a reason. And he's done this because he is holy and he, and he wanted to have relationship with you. Now, do you remember what you were like without him? Do you remember where you came from, who you were, the kind of person you were? What thought life did you have without him? What did you think about yourself? What, what did your identity consist of before you met God? Basically, in the words of Revelation 2, do you remember your first love? If we refuse to practice remembrance, our relationship with God begins to slowly deteriorate. It just happens naturally. Uh, we don't have to try <laughs> to stop practicing remembrance. And as our spiritual life dries up, we spiral into forgetfulness naturally. And forgetting doesn't take special effort, it just, it just happens over time. <clears throat> Excuse me, happens over time. If we're not shaped by our memories of God and what he's done, we will be shaped by what the world thinks of us and him. And the, the gaps in our memory of his goodness, faithfulness, glory, and mercy in our lives will be filled by something else, usually lies. When we forget God and what he's done, we forget our identity in him. Like I said, remembrance is one of the most important spiritual practices for the Christian. And if stewarded well, will dive us into a deeper, vibrant, joyful, grateful, unshakable, intimate relationship with him. Your worship becomes more personal when you remember things that he's done in your life personally. And by doing this, and here's point two, by doing this, point two is it allows us to live out of a place of trust and gratitude. When we remember what God has done for us, it allows us to live out of a place of trust and gratitude. And we, it's not just something that we're remembering and being shaped by, but we're actually transformed in the way that we live. So remembering God allows us to relate to him closer, but remembering what he's done allows us to build our faith and live out of a place of identity, trust, gratitude. As I was preparing for this, I was reminded of Ephesians chapter five. Be imitators of God as dear children, right? Do you ever struggle with seeing others in a negative light that maybe make mistakes? Um, sometimes you, you might wanna just shake someone, <laughs> like stop this. Uh, do you ever live out of a, I mean, if we live out of a place of what he's done, then it actually becomes to be more difficult to look down at other people. Uh, we, we become more forgiving when we remember, meditate, and think about how God has forgiven us. We start to treat other people differently. The words of Jesus in John 13 are, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. 
Jesus had a sacrificial love. He said he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Living out of a conscience awareness of what he's done for us motivates us to treat others differently, to live differently, to behave differently, to act towards everyone around us differently. We bring hope to a world that is run by fear. Remembering God's love for us fuels our love for others. We walk with a sense of gratitude. As I was preparing for this sermon, um, last week I phoned a friend of mine who's a counselor, he practices in this, this area, and I just, he's, he's a believer, so I just started asking him, like, hey, I'm wandering into a psychology field here a little bit, there's some undertones here, it's remembrance, right? And so I'm just like, hey, uh, what do you think of the biblical concept of remembrance? What do you think of this? And he just dove right into gratitude. That's just what reminded him of it. He's like, Dude, I practice gratitude all the time in my practice. And he kept telling me about how much he practices this, this idea of remembering pleasant memories from the past in order to heal their current future in his practice. Did you know that remembering what God has done naturally enables you to be healthier and treat others better? Uh, studies have actually found that gratitude improves psychological health, enhances your empathy and reduces aggression, and actually increases your mental strength. Um, especially if you're going through a hard time. So basically, to sum it up, practicing remembrance and being grateful for what has, God has done makes you more loving towards others, joyful, patient, kind. Is this starting to sound familiar? If we forget what God has done for us, we can forget that the same God who loves us loves the person that we're currently upset with. The beautiful thing here is, this is an invitation. It's an invitation to give God our capacity for attention for a moment and just remember and choose to reflect and be grateful and be transformed by it. So then the third and final outcome of remembering who God is and what he's done is that it gives us hope to trust in the dark times. In Joshua chapter 4 verses 12 uh, through 13, we're going to jump back for just a moment. Um, actually, we're, we don't even need to read it. I'll just remind you guys. After the people set a memorial for what God has done, only then were the warriors ready for battle. So it was only after they set their memorial, only then the 40,000 came out and they were ready for battle. They needed to stop and commemorate the moment, the holy moment where God did this for them, before they continued into the promised land and any battles took place. Now, I want us to understand when we're walking through the Jordan River and take a stone with us. We need to remember before we face the next battles in our life what God has already done. In those answered prayers, in his intimate involvement, in the times he carries you through when there seems like there's no way out, remember that. Stack those stones so that you would be ready for battle when the time comes. Build your faith. We stop and remember before moving forward. When there's difficulty, stop and remember the involvement of God before beginning to deal with it. Remember God's goodness. Remembering God's goodness moves us to respond in hope rather than fear. Now we know that he's with us. He's done it before. He'll do it again. Because he has been involved, he will be involved. Because he parted the Red Sea, he will also part the Jordan. Because he promised the Israelites a land flowing of milk and honey, there's no nation that's going to stand in the way. Because he was faithful, he'll continue to be faithful. And I want us to think about, are we stopping to remember God before facing our battles? Or are we just running into them trying to fix it on our own? Are we keeping the involvement of God in the midst of trouble? Is, is, his, is our conscience awareness of him on our minds when we walk through trials. If you've been with, walking with God for some time and you're in this room, you probably have a handful of testimonies. You probably have something that he's done, a way that he's been with you. Maybe he made a way when there seemed like there was no way. Or maybe you've been with God for a while and you have some hard times that you walk through. You would, and you know deep down that you would not be sitting here if it wasn't for God. You, maybe you don't even know how to explain it to people, the pain and the hurt, but but you know for sure that God was with you through it and he gave you the strength to persevere and you're here today. Regardless, everything doesn't always turn out super good in this life. Jesus said we'll have troubles in this world, but cultivating the practice of remembrance and helps us manage our awareness of the one who overcame the world. See, think of Paul's letter to the Philippians, right? He's writing this from prison to the church in Philippi and uh, this, is, this is Philippians 4.13. Uh, some of us have a coffee mug with this verse on it. I can, do all things, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, a lot of times we take that and it's like, yes, but it's a really good verse. 
But what he's saying there in context is that he, whether he's down low or up high, no matter what he faces, what trouble he goes through, he's writing this from prison, guys. He's writing, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Remember to remember who he is and what he's done. When we forget to remember him and what he's done, our awareness, is, our awareness of his involvement fades from our conscience. In the midst of our busy schedules and responsibilities, as our prayers fade into repetitive, checkmark-like mundane tasks, I know what that's like, our, like on our drives to work or school, we lose our sense of closeness with the one who actually never left, and the one who knows us intimately. And this whole situation, this spiral of forgetfulness, makes us very vulnerable in the tough times. But the thing is, if we would only stop and look around, he is present, he is involved, and he cares deeper than we know. When the Philistines seized David, he was basically a prisoner of war, he, uh, he said these words, record my misery, list my tears on your scroll. Some translations say, keep my tears in a bottle or a wineskin. Are they not in your record? In his poetic language, David illustrates the memory and involvement of God in our tough times. He remembers you. One day, he'll wipe every tear himself. But remembering all God has done gives us hope in the midst of darkness. When what do you think that does to our faith? Or the faith of those who are around us as we carry that hope into a world? So remembering allows us to live in the awareness of a present and involved God. Allows us to live out of a place of gratitude, imitating God as children and showing hope to those around us. But it also gives us hope to get through the dark times. So the question for this morning then, and something I want all of us to ponder on, is what is it that causes us to forget God? Because we all do from time to time, if we're honest. What causes me to forget God? There may be many reasons, right? There may be many reasons. One of them might be, like, for some people, maybe it's rebellion, and because they're far from him, and they, they don't actually know him or experience him in that way. One of my favorite quotes from an atheist is a guy named, um, I hope that's okay, I'm quoting an atheist in church. It's a guy named Francis Crick, uh, who was a molecular biologist, and he co-discovered the DNA molecule. And what's, what he said is very ironic to me. It's, it's kind of funny. He basically said this uh, when talking about the DNA. He said, we must constantly remind ourselves that what we see was not designed, but rather evolved. When God in his creation is staring you in the face that you have to keep reminding yourself that he's not there or else you might fall into believing, that's kind of ironic and it could be a problem. But I think for most of us that's not the case, right? For most Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, people that just want to live a life of honor to God, I think most of the time the reason we forget God is either some measure of prosperity or busyness. Moses gave this warning to the Israelites earlier. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 through 15. When talking about prosperity, Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 15. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Sounds like a good time. Then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground, where there was no water, who brought you, out, who brought you water out of the flinty rock. And, and he continues. He's saying, look, when everything is going well, be careful. Don't forget God in this time. Sometimes it's easier to pray for things when we don't have them and then forget God when we do. And this is something that we all fall into if we're not careful not to remember. Or if we're not careful to remember. And then busyness. I think this applies to a lot of us. You know, just like a goldfish is in a fish tank, it like gets distracted. I used to have a fish tank. But it gets distracted by, like, uh, by you know, pebbles on the ground or the new toy that you give the goldfish. Um, it doesn't even realize it's in the bowl anymore sometimes, I think. Um, so similarly, do we get distracted by our to-do lists and tasks that we don't realize that we're actually swimming in the grace of God every day, and His grace renews itself with every morning? If only we would stop and look. If only we would remember. I once, uh, I don't know if you guys have friends like this, but I have a friend who, uh, he always has time to hang out. It's pretty cool. 
So I don't know how, because he's, like, he's married, he has successful businesses, like he, he has a lot going on, but every time you call him, he's like, yeah, where am I meeting you? And it's just like, whoa. And so I asked him, like, bro, how, did you, do, how do you do this? Like, I just don't get it. Like, like, I'm scheduling things like a week out and you're available in 30 minutes, you know? Like, how is this happening? And, uh, and he said something that stuck with me so well. Um, it really, really, like, did something to me. He said, Alex, I prioritize things that matter. I make time. And so that got me thinking, are, are we making time to slow down and prioritize remembering God? Because in the midst of our busy schedules, we can still prioritize him. Make time. Make time. No distractions. God, you have my full conscious attention. I'm giving you the gift of my conscience. You have my awareness. I know it's easier said than done, but it will increase your awareness of him dramatically. It will grow your faith, build your trust in him. It will allow you to cultivate and live out of a place of identity and gratitude. It will change how you go through the ups and downs. Ultimately, guys, it will transform your whole life. And, and I know this is easier said than done. This isn't something that I've mastered, but this seems to be what the scripture wants us to do. At the end of Joshua's life, in the final pages of the book, if we go to the very end, the last couple, couple chapters, he gathers everyone together. He gathers all the elders and everyone who leads the people and all of that. And you know what he does? He reminds them. He reminds them of everything that God has been for them, what he's done, and only then does he give them instructions on how to live forward. Okay, glad you guys are still with me. So, what does practicing remembrance look like today? Well, you could pretty much be creative. Whatever you do, make it your own and make a practice of it. Uh, if I could challenge you to do something this week, just one thing this week, schedule it on your calendar, maybe even schedule it today so you don't forget. Schedule 15 minutes and put your phone, this isn't just like normal, like you know, your daily prayer, I'm, I'm talking like put your phone in the other room, it's just you, God, pen, paper, and 15 minutes. And just say, God, you have my full attention. No distractions. Just invite him and begin to remember and write down the things that he's done in your life. And then let that bring you into worship, whatever worship looks like. It could be a little different for everyone. Maybe you're an artistic person and you love to draw. And maybe God's taken your marriage through some, some storms and you drew a picture that helps you remember what he's done and that he sustained you through something. Maybe draw a picture and hang it on your wall so you can remember what he's done on a daily basis. Build that remembrance into your life. Maybe you're a singer and you love to sing. Maybe you can write a short song and sing it as worship to God that is personal to you, that, remember, that helps you to remember what he's done. Maybe you hate writing and you can have a voice memo that you come back to once in a while and you keep a voice memo of all the record that, that God has done in your life. And uh, maybe when you went through a hard time, there was a psalm or a, a song or a Bible verse. Print that out, keep it in your car or at your desk at work and let it remind you that he's near. And maybe there's a place you drive by. I know there's a lot of ideas, but maybe there's a place you drive by and, and this place reminds you of God's involvement. Maybe it's the church you were saved at or the camp or something or your friend that you were praying for or maybe it's a place where God has healed you or maybe it's a place where God was with you through the storm. Maybe pull over for a few minutes there. Let that remind you what he's done and meditate on it and thank him for it. Grab a journal or use the notes app in your phone and just keep a record of what God has done and revisit that during your time of prayer. However you stack your stones from the Jordan, do it in a way that's personal to you. And that will remind you of who God is and what he's done in your life. In the words of the psalmist, what causes me to be still and know that he is God? What causes me to remember? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were enemies, he made us his friends. When we were far, he brought us near. When we were foreigners, he made us sons and daughters, adopted into the family of God, paid for by the precious blood of Jesus on the cross. That's something we can remember. And not only, we, we, the reason we love, we only love because he first loved us. And now we have an open invitation to remember him because he's already remembering you. Can we rise to our feet? I'm gonna come to a conclusion here. I'd like us to read something together, if we could. This is going to be in Psalm 77. Psalm 77, verses 11 through 12. Awesome. Okay, if we could read this together before we go into a time of reflection and prayer. 
Ready? I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. We're going to do something a little bit different before we get into prayer. I want us to practice remembrance uh, this morning. Um, if, so no longer look at me. I, I'm just, it's just you and God. Close your eyes if that helps you. Look down, look up, whatever, if that helps you. I want us to bec become aware of his presence in this very moment. I want this, us to treat this as a holy moment. So I'm going to pray some things, and, and you can repeat in your own words, or you can meditate on what I'm saying, and, and just address your heart to God with what we're doing. It's just you and the Lord. So Holy Spirit, we invite you once again into this place, into our hearts. We're open and waiting on you to speak, Lord. Distractions aside, you have our full conscious attention, God. We make you priority right now. Lord, for every person in this room, we ask that you would remind us of the life we lived before you saved us. Show us what you saved us from, Lord. God, remind us of the moment that we gave our lives to you. The moment we knew that all our sins were forgiven, God. Help us to re-experience that. Help us to reignite that first love for you, Lord. Help us, Holy Spirit, oh, help us to remember. Lord, I ask that for everyone in this room and their hearts and minds, help us to remember a time that you came through, that you showed up, a time where you were there for us, Lord, a time where you walked with us through some pain and suffering, but we know for a fact you never left our side. Allow us, God, now to meditate on your goodness and what you've done in our lives. And if someone's going through a hard time in this place, would that empower them, God, to hope? Would that empower them to hope? And now, God, I pray and ask that in light of these memories, you would show us your immense love for us. You've already demonstrated your love for us and that while we were sinners, Jesus, you died for us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you help us to understand this in light of these memories as well. Help us to see how we are to treat those people that are around us, God, because of what you've done for us. Help us to live, Holy Spirit, help us to live with a conscious awareness of your presence, of your involvement, of your, of your love, of what you're doing in our lives from day to day. And may we step forward confidently into any situation, knowing that you've never left our side, knowing that you're faithful, knowing that your promises are yes and amen. We take this moment and we give it to you, God. We treat this as a holy moment. We're in reverence and awe of your glory, your power, your love, your involvement. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you continue to bring memories, thoughts, phrases, songs, and may this turn into glorious praise for you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your involvement. We thank you for what you've done in our lives and that we get to step into remembrance and have relationship with a triune God of love, joy, and peace. Thank you, Lord. If you're in this place and you need prayer for any area of your life, we invite you to come forward. For the rest of us, let that remembrance drive us now to worship.
remember. Start to be grateful for what God has done. Start to allow the Holy Spirit to remind you of the things that He's done. He's walked us through so many things. As we truly just let distraction go away and we recognize that He is the one who saved us. He's the one that's healed us. He's the one that's been forgiving us. He's the one that's brought us into the kingdom. In your own words right now as we continue to worship, start to be grateful. Start to speak gratitude. Start to release praise. He's a good God. He's a good God. In that remembrance, allow your faith to be established. Recognizing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to this earth and died. And because He's raised again, we also live. There is reason to celebrate. There's reason to rejoice. There's reason to be grateful. There's reason to believe in Him. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. We exalt you, Jesus. Come on, in your own words, start to thank Him. Start to lift Him up. Lift Him up in your life. Lift Him up in the situation that's been scaring you. Lift Him up. Recognize that He is enthroned. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. The first and the last. The Lion and the Lamb. The victorious one. We thank you. We exalt you, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. of God. Lord, we thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit. We ask you, Holy Spirit, would you help us in our remembrance? Would you help us, Lord God? Help us, Lord God, remember those things that you've already accomplished. The victories that you've done in our life. The Red Seas that you've split. The Jordan Rivers that you've split, God the giants that have been slain. God, we thank you. We thank you for the faith that you place in our lives. And we thank you that you continue to transform our minds, renewing our minds, allowing the Word of God to be that mirror, 
to renew our minds, allowing the Word of God to be that mirror that reminds us of the things that you've accomplished, reminds us of the cross, reminds us of the empty tomb, reminds us of our future. We thank you so much for the living Word that is saturated with the Spirit, that is in our lives, Lord God, alive, sharper than any double-edged sword that divides our thoughts and intentions. We thank you for your word. And we ask you, let that word continue to do the work that you sent it to do. You said not a single word that you sent comes back void, but it fulfills the very task that you sent it to accomplish. We thank you so much, God. We exalt you. We stand and praise, glory, glorify your holy name, God, exalting you. We thank you. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We glorify your holy name. You are worthy. And everybody said.